let's take a look at some new malware uploaded to Malware Bazaar. So this has been uploaded by AbuseCH themselves, the creators of Malware Bazaar. Now this actually has a file name of offer document 25.lnk. Now an LNK file in the context of Windows is a link file or a shortcut file. Now how can a link file or a shortcut file be malicious? Link files in the context of malware are often being used either to run hidden malware on something like a USB stick, or they're being used to run legitimate executables on your system that then go and act as something known as a download cradle. So they're gonna go off and fetch a script or an executable and launch it from a remote server. Tools that can do this are stuff like PowerShell or MSI exec, or even chaining some legitimate executables like search util to download the file and then using start from a command prompt to launch the malicious executable. So how can we analyze this link file? There's a couple of tools that we can use. I've gone ahead and downloaded the file, but we can't look at it in a normal fashion like we would with some of our other samples. And I'll show you what I mean by that. If I right click it and I try to use something like detect it easy, you'll immediately see it's actually analyzed what the link file is pointing to. So you can see that it says the file name is PowerShell. And if we were to open this up in a hexadecimal editor, we can see, okay, it's showing as MZ header, so a PE file. But this is for PowerShell that's sitting on our system, not the link file. Now, with any link file on Windows, you can right click it and go to properties and get a bit of an idea on what it's pointing at. I'm not sure why this had the comment 919022, but that might be something of interest to keep in mind. Now, when we talk about the target here, we can see that it is pointing to PowerShell, but it's actually only using PowerShell to then run a different executable that's on your system. So you'll notice that it's using the environment variable and it's specifying some wildcards. Now this WS2 MHA may not seem like it means much, but what actually happens is that if you specify wildcards, they will actually basically expand and get all of the matches for it. So there's only one match that matches this kind of regex, which is C Windows System32 MSHTA.exe. So this is the executable used for launching HTA files. Now we can see that this actually goes out and fetches something from this domain, which we'll look at in just a sec. But first, let's see if there's anything interesting sitting in this link file, because there's a number of tools that we can use to parse the actual format of this link file that give us a bit more information. There is the link parser, which we can find on Google Archive. This was actually created back in 2012 though, so this is a little bit older. And then there is more industry standard LECMD tool that is created by the one and only Eric Zimmerman. Now, Eric Zimmerman is a fantastic digital forensics and incident response professional and has created a number of widely available tools that are used within digital forensics and incident response. First off, I've got the older link parser tool. And what I'm going to do is just use it against the link file and see what outcomes we get. And you can see that it's pulled out a bit more information than what we actually had, just kind of eyeballing the file. In particular, there is actually this metadata property store that has mention of a value. Now in that value, there is a user identifier. So this this is actually the security identifier of the user account that created this malicious link file. This is going to be unique given it has a unique identifier per the domain that it's created on. If we look at security identifiers on the Windows documentation, they basically have a format of having a revision level. So most of the time, almost always, it's going to be S1. And then you're also going to have an identifier authority. So once again, almost all of the time, we're going to have S15, and then we're going to have an identifier that specifies the domain. So that goes all the way down to the end, and then it has a relative identifier. Now, the relative identifier here of 500 is the local administrator account. So that tells us that the user has used the local administrator account on their system. The 
identifier for this domain could be used to track maybe similar malicious link files that have been created and used. There are other elements that are common in malicious link files, but it looks like they've been stripped or they're just not present in this link file. So for example, the NetBIOS would be one of those. So let's take a look at another tool. Let's use LECMD. What we're gonna have to do is specify a file and then we're gonna specify the link file. And if we run that, we can see that the same information has been pulled out but it's presented in a little bit of a nicer way so we can see now once again in the header field it says that the target created modified and access is null so this is where the unknown was seen in the other file it does rip out the source created modified and access as well so this actually gives us some timestamps as opposed to no timestamps that being said generally there will be net bios for a system name that this was created on but in this case it's not present now to prove i'm not making this stuff up I'm gonna go ahead and create a link file on this system and show you what that output might look like so in the same folder I'm just gonna right click new and create a shortcut and we're gonna name this cmd.exe because this is what we want to run when it's run so we want to name it cmd.exe and it's pointing at cmd.exe now in our terminal, if we run the same, but we specify it to be on cmd.exe, you can see it's ripped out a lot more information. Of particular note, there is my user identifier in this VM. So this actually is a different number to what we saw before. We can actually see a bit more information as well. Basically the Mac vendor and the Mac address tied to this particular system, the machine ID. So this is the NetBIOS name of the system that I'm currently on, which is Spark and it's given us a bunch more information that can be used for pretty much anything from tracking to attribution purposes. We can also see a serial number, which could be of interest as well. And this is tied to the actual hard drive in my virtual machine. Now, something to keep in mind is that the Mac vendor may give you a bit of an indication on how this link file was created as well, if it is present. That is because this PCS system technic is tied to VirtualBox, which is what I'm running this VM in. So now we know that this is going out and pulling a payload from a URL, which in this case is going to be this equid.us. So if we scan the base URL of that website, it does look like this is a website tied to a Uzbekistan entity. I do not know the language, but if we translate it, it seems to translate to Andijan Institute of Economy and Construction. Now, unfortunately, this website is based on WordPress and it may have a vulnerable plugin or a vulnerable vulnerable instance of WordPress. So it does look like, unfortunately, this website has been compromised to host the next stage of our malware. Now, if we scan that room5.hda file on this server, we can actually see that it has a VB script that is within a HTA file that's going to be executed. So let's dive into that a bit further. All we have to do is hit HTTP and hit show response, and we actually get the entirety of that payload for our second stage. So let's download this and do some more analysis. So I've gone ahead and downloaded the HTA file. Let's take a look at what it's doing. It may seem a bit daunting at first, but it's actually quite trivial for us to reverse this. This is actually an array of characters. So you can see that this is defined as an array, but the characters don't quite translate to particular values. Now, the reason is because if we actually look up, we can see what's happening. There is this being defined, this UUU, UQE as 39341. We also see that there is defining the characters from these values. So the char values associated with these numbers, but it's not using these full values. It's actually using this. So this is for each one in the actual array itself for each value in FCSS and FCSS is the actual array. It's saying for each of those values, it's going to subtract this number, this 39341. And that's actually how it's formulating the string for the next part of our payload. We can go down and we can also see some other array that's being used here as well. So both of these we can actually take and translate into something a little bit more legible. So let's go ahead and take a look at the big array because this is likely going to be what is running for our next stage. So I'm gonna copy the entirety of this array, go over to Cyberchef and put it in. Now, what we actually have to do is have that subtract occur on every single one of these numbers. Now, pumping these into a calculator is gonna take forever. The 
That's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it. This I don't way. know that way. Why would they change math? Uh, math is math. Okay, math Dad. is math. So we are going to actually use a little bit of hackery using CyberChef to be able to do this. The first thing that we want to do is actually place these values in registers. Now we want to create a fork operation so that all of the actions that we take is going to occur on each individual one of these values. So let's run fork. We are going to split this. So this is what is going to define the split. We are going to split it based on a comma. And now we can see that they are all on separate lines. Now we're going to have to use the register to function because what we want to do you'll see this actually cycles through all of the values and what we want to do is do a bit of a hackery here so we can see that there is a subtract function in cyberchef but we actually have to specify the delimiter that this is going to be used against now if we try to do it based on a line feed we need the value that's going to be subtracted on a new line so we can use something else so in this case let's just say a comma and what we're going to do is we're going to do a find and replace so if we put this above the subtract Let's just disable that for a second so we don't cause any issues. What we're going to do is we're going to replace what's in each register and to prove that it's not only one value in that register, but the value of each individual line, we can go dollar sign R zero. So that's how we access the register. And we want to replace that with dollar sign R zero. And if we bake this, let's get rid of global match here. We will actually see that the output is the exact same regardless of whether we have that on or not because we're not doing any changes yet. What we have is a hard-coded number that we want to change for every single one of these values. So let's create a comma and the value is this 39341. So let's put that now in as well. And now you can see every single line actually has a comma and the 39341, the value that we're going to have subtracted from the larger value. So let's actually turn on the subtract now. Remember that the fork operation is going to do this on everyone. And now we can actually see numbers that are char values that can be translated back into the original words that are going to make sense to us. So to do this, what we're going to now have to do is do a from decimal because we can see that decimal is going to convert them back into its original form. So we can use from decimal and we can actually see now that it actually does it for every individual line because we haven't merged it back, but we can actually begin to see a string that forms. So let's make this a little bit more legible. We're going to have to do a merge so let's merge them all back in we are going to have to do a replace and what we're going to do is we are going to find a new line and replace it with nothing actually let's replace the new line with a space now we can actually see that what we're doing is going from decimal and base as the delimiter so now we actually get the next stage of our payload that we want to analyze so let's take this and save it as the next stage i've also just gone ahead and taken that smaller array so that smaller array that we can see here that formulates wscript.shell which just indicates that wscript is going to be used to run this next stage so now looking at that downloaded stage stage three dot bin. It looks like there's a little bit of noise here. So one of the things that I'm going to do is actually do a find and replace. So we can do that using the extended search mode in notepad plus plus and replace everything. And now it looks a little bit more legible. So we can see the aim is to use PowerShell in order to write a file to disk. We can also see a function that seems to be checking if something ends with something. We don't know what it is yet. And if it does, it's going to use run dll 32exe to run it. Now, a good assumption here is that this might actually be the extension .dll so that if a DLL file is being pulled down, it's going to use run DLL32 to launch it because it can't launch by itself. We can also see another one, which might just be if it's an executable, it's going to use PowerShell in order to run the file. And then there's another one. And this one's a little bit more interesting because I'm guessing this is going to be an MSI file. But the difference here is that the malware author or whoever has created this has actually put in a typo. We can see it is MIS exec. The problem is this is actually MSI exec on a Windows operating system. If they push down an MSI file, it actually wouldn't launch and would break at this point of the chain. So typos are pretty important. We can actually also see evidence of it downloading a file. So there is this .NET class that's being used to specify a TLS connection should occur. So this is obviously connecting to a remote server using TLS and it's downloading data. Now the data that it's downloading, we actually have to backtrack a bit to actually see what's going on. It's going to be using a new object of some sort of maybe .NET object that's being used to download the actual file. So maybe the download class. 
we actually have to understand what's happening with this function here because it does look like this is what's being used to transpose those numbers into something that's a bit more relevant. We can see that that function has an input that it takes. So we give it an input of those numbers, which is an array. And then it's defining a variable, which is 77153. We can also see that that is now later used for each of those values that are passed in, each of these in that. What it's going to do is it's going to subtract one from the other. We once again just have a simple substitution or subtraction that is occurring here that we can actually use to get that next stage. So what I'm going to do is actually take a look at these and use the same operation that we had in CyberChef, the difference being that we're going to use 77153. So I've changed it to 77153. And now if I start with the first array, we can actually see that it does come out to .dll. We can take this second array and we could probably do this for all of these. So this actually isn't an executable that's going to be launched with PowerShell.exe. This is actually running a PowerShell script. That makes sense. I probably should have assumed that. And then we also have .msi. Once again, misexec is not going to launch an msi file. And we can see net.webclient. So this is just specifying that it's going to be using that particular .net class in order to download that file. Now, the main thing that we see here is that there is an environment variable that's being expanded. So this environment variable of app data expands to user app data roaming. So something is going to be deployed in the roaming directory with the name rumor.exe. What we're going to do is actually take this to see where that next stage is being pulled down from. And we have the same function, right? And we can see it's hosted on the same compromised WordPress website. So if I go back and look at that WordPress website, we can actually see that it is still hosting this rumor.exe. Now, what is this rumor.exe? Because this is ultimately the payload that's going to be deployed on the endpoint. If we look it up on VirusTotal, oh, lights up like a Christmas tree, except without the green. Basically, this has an overwhelming number of detections for formbook malware. So now we have a good idea that someone has compromised this Uzbekistan website to upload a malicious HTA file that is going to be launching the formbook malware. So now we actually know what that malicious link file is doing. I won't go too much into the actual formbook malware because I might save that for another video where we can deep dive into that. So thanks so much for watching. That's all I wanted to show you today. Let me know your thoughts, feelings, comments, anything else in the comment section below and I will catch you next time.